<laughs> so welcome everyone and today is Tuesday July the 7th 2020 and this is the Ocean Beach Networking Group Zoom call and I'm very excited uh, to have Kevin Ellinger hopefully I'm pronouncing his last name correctly speaking yes. speaking today and his topic is how disruptive technologies will disrupt our lives um, but before we turn it over to Kevin, um, we're going to do the icebreaker portion of the meeting. Um, and so the icebreaker for those that just joined us is what new technology do you find most interesting or most scary? What new technology do you find most interesting or most scary? Um, so do I have any volunteers to go first? I have first. I'll go. Okay. I saw Bill's hand first, so thank you, Bill. Well, um, don't want to preempt anyone. Uh, yeah, I'm fascinated with that uh, question and the topics today, being an analog guy trying to uh, navigate a digital world. The most scary um, uh, technology I see coming into the forefront is uh, uh, 3D printing. Um, I, I was astonished a couple of years ago. I lost my brother to uh, uh, bladder cancer. And as I researched that, I discovered that, well, they're actually printing organs. They're printing uh, buildings. Uh, the ability to just download and print goods and services uh, in our homes, you know, will have such a dramatic impact on commerce. Uh, interstate uh, commerce and uh, you know trucking and uh, I mean to me it's just kind of mind-blowing to to imagine it's almost science fiction so uh, that that's one of several that uh, leaves me in a state of angst all right and do you want to tell the group briefly about uh, your business um, shadiest guy in Southern California uh, uh, owner and operator of uh, Elegant Outdoor Shade Design. Um, I'm proud to, if anybody, if you live in OB and might have noticed uh, a new installation we put on the roof of uh, the holding company is uh, my latest installation and rather visible, but uh, love helping people create cool, intimate outdoor living and dining space. Awesome, good job. And since Kim had her hand up right after Bill, we'll ask Kim to go next. But before we do, I would ask everyone, uh, best practice is to mute your microphone when you're not talking. It helps cut down on some of the background noise. And please try to limit your response to one minute so we leave enough time for Kevin's talk today. So Kim, how are you? I'm great, thanks. I'm Kim Schultz. Uh, I'm at swimkim.com. I do swimming and water safety um, all over the world. And um, I focus on parents, caregivers, teachers of um, kids ages zero through five um, working with uh, Learn to Swim programs. I have a DIY program online because I can't be in the water right now. Um, so talking about technology, since I can't be in the water right now, I'm doing lots of uh, different random jobs to stay, uh, stay alive. And um, one of the things I've been doing is taking a contract contact tracing course. And so some of that technology I think is amazing. Um, and some of it really scares the crap out of me. So um, I just, before I got on this call, was listening to sort of some of the things they do in other countries that where they can do that, where you have, you know, apps on your phone and it'll just tell you if you have been in contact with someone that has COVID. So that is really cool and interesting, but super scary. So yeah, um, kind of balancing that, um, you know, going with new technology and kind of being afraid of privacy regulations. <laughs> Chuck, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So Milo, how are you? Why don't you go next? Oh, and I got to make sure I can let you share the screen. Let's see, I had it turned off for security reasons. There, now you should be able to share your screen because I know you wanted to do that. Wait, I think you're on mute. 
Let's try that again. <laughs> I'm Milo Shapiro. I am trying to be professional from the waist up right now because the technology that's disrupting everybody's world is Zoom, particularly mine because as a motivational speaker and as a coach, it's my only way of dealing with people. So in this world where everybody is just Zooming like mad, I've had to switch gears as a public speaking coach. People aren't having these in-person meetings, but they still need to shine when they're on a call, when they have all this Zoom going on and stand out in the Hollywood squares. So I'm working with people from my book, Public Speaking, Get A's, Not Z's, and I'm helping people in a lot of ways. I'm helping CEOs and CFOs and entrepreneurs, salespeople. I've worked with ministers and engineers and a prostitute and scientists and a, uh, some students and lots of others. Probably nobody heard a word I said since prostitute, but yes, even they need to speak sometimes. I'll explain why offline sometimes. I work with people on their sales pitch, on their speaking, explaining their advantage to others and these 30 second intros that we get in so many of these meetings. So that's my main business. Off to the side, when I'm not helping people be prepared, polished and powerful, I'm also a photo editor. So just a few of my works, here's something that I was able to create for somebody. I had this picture, it's totally damaged, got it back to there, recreated the background for her. We had this sad wedding look, we brought it to this so there was a better memory for them baby picture, just totally in bad shape, I was able to redo for them. A background, just making it a nicer shot instead of having all that junk in the background. So that's freshinyourphoto.com. If anyone knows anyone, looking for that. Back to you, Chuck. Thank you very much. Uh, well done. And um, Garrison Fletcher, let me go ahead and unmute you and please introduce yourself to the group. I think this is the first time you've been on an OB networking group call, is that right? It is. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm Garrison Fletcher. My company is Apex Tapping Graphics. I have some images as well that I'll show you. Um, I'm a graphic designer. So uh, before and afters. Oh, that's not very centered. No, is that wonderful? Uh, before and afters for you. And um, the before and low. So on the left is kind of a jiggity low that they have. On the right is now the, the much better shaped um, version of it. The I'm failing today, which Harrison, is I'm exciting. not seeing your screen yet. Um, it's just saying you're sharing. There we go. Uh, is it now? I'm out? seeing it now. Yes. Okay, great. So on the left is a before and after I see my internet is poor. So up to the before, um, uh, the circles outline things that I did differently. You see how sharp the trees or the houses are, things of that nature. Interconnect uh, just uh, probably stop there. But uh, I do flyers that add special, mostly print stuff. So, corporate entities, branding, things of that nature. Um, what makes me different is my background in psychology, not in art. So, I ask all those questions that uh, most people don't ask. Um, the disruptive technology for me is probably the thought of drones delivering packages. And then I think from that's going to be the extension of. Um, Uber for drones where they're delivering people from location to location and how many of those are going to be, you know, flying around and what that's going to look like. So um, the safety of them, the um, ability for them to, you know, deliver packages and not be interrupted or um, somebody taking a bat like a pinata, pinata, things of that nature, I think are going to be um, interesting. All right. Um, well, welcome. We're glad you're here. There was something going on with your internet, um, but in any event, let's move along and uh, ask Dan Dennison to introduce himself and answer the icebreaker question. Hi. I'm good, Chuck. Thank you. Um, I think that the uh, what's happened with video and the ability to use it and the ability to interact with people like through Zoom and uh, other uh, networks is really very, very interesting. And I, uh, there's still, you know, kind of a development curve to make it a little easier to use, more consistent. But I think it's really a great technology. And I know that in a time like this, uh, where you really have to stay distant from family and friends, uh, it is helpful, even like the, the little Facebook chats and stuff like that. We have a grandson who just turned one and we haven't seen him since February, and I hope to see him before he's uh, two. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, my active business right now is, is real estate. Uh, I have a long background in both commercial and residential real estate in five states. And I came back here, and, um, and I really enjoy doing that because 
I think that it's, uh, it's always a complicated process and it never happens quickly. And I think even now that's really, really important to really do the analytical look. And it, it, the market is crazy right now. There's not enough houses. And I mean, I even made an offer last week over asking price. We didn't even get in the discussion and the house was overpriced anyway. So I don't know. And I also, I have an opinion about where it's all going to go into the next, next year, but it's not a popular opinion. <laughs> thanks, Chuck. Well, thanks. We're glad you're here. And Raquel, I just realized um, you may not have heard the icebreaker question. And in case you didn't figure it out, is it is what new technology do you find most interesting or most scary? So we'll give you um, some time to think. I won't call on you quite yet. Um, and we'll let Thalia go next. Hi, Thalia. Hello there. Hi, everybody. My name is Thalia. Good to be here. And uh, like a few of you, I'm also a creative. It's great to see other creatives on the call. I do web design. I do graphic design. My background is in design management. And uh, currently, I have, uh, I'm a freelance designer. So I do uh, anything. I'm basically like a Swiss Army knife of design. If you need a billboard, if you need print materials, if you need graphics, uh, I do all of that stuff. Um, I will show you my screen. I don't have uh, too many screens, but I'll just show you my website and I'll pop it into the chat as well. Um, and I love to network with other creatives. So uh, feel free to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, technology that's scary. I def something immediately came to mind when you asked this icebreaker. So there are times that I say a word like icebreaker and then I'll just happen to be looking at my phone and scrolling through my Instagram and I'll see like an ice crusher or ice, you know, like something related to something I've said, but contemporaneously and suddenly I'm getting fed an ad for it on my phone. So that to me is very scary because I'm like, either someone's listening to me or they know me so well that they, that some advertisers predicted that they're going to send me this particular ad on my phone. So. It, but it's fascinating at the same time, because sometimes I'm like, oh, I do need an icebreaker. Okay. <laughs> so that's it. And okay. I, real quick, let me, uh, I'm, I'm also relaunching my site. So I'll, is it okay if I share my screen real quick? Sure. Okay. Let's see, here we go. Let me get this full size. I know how to do this. Okay, there we go. Little Sparrow Design, Bespoke Creative Services, all of those things, come and check out my site. I've got some case studies. I've got my portfolio up there. And uh, as I said, I'll put the URL in the, in the chat. And uh, I do a free consultation call. Um, so give a call if uh, you have any questions. That's it. That's good. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Um, Marissa, are you ready to go? Yes. Hi, I am Marissa. I'm a local tutor for math and science. Um, I got a degree in bioengineering and neuroscience at UCSD, so I can do pretty much any math or science for college or high school level. Um, in addition, I do a bioengineering consulting. Uh, for example, right now I am working with a research group creating um, an encapsulation method for their uh, therapeutic and also um, being a consultant for their EEG, the brain recorder they'll use, uh, and being able to process the data they get from it. So I do all kinds of things like data processing, mechanical engineering, electrical. Uh, so if you need uh, someone like that. Uh, technology that kind of scares me, I guess, would be something like uh, genetic engineering is one of the more scary things that I see us facing in the future, um, just not knowing uh, the repercussions of it and such. Um, but to add to that, uh, I also think that the way our phones listen to us is kind of scary. Uh, I also see some ads and such that relate to uh, communication I'll be having or something that definitely wasn't searched online. So, yeah. 
Great answers. Great to see you too. And Raquel, I know you said you have to log off at 1230, which is perfectly fine. We're glad you're here today. And uh, please tell the group about your business and answer the icebreaker question. <laughs> I'm like, are you going to meet me? I mean, oh, hi guys, um, I'm Raquel Kuzi from The Stronghold. Um, we have jujitsu and self-defense and fitness. Uh, we just brought our fitness program back. Uh, we were a CrossFit, a, a CrossFit box maybe about four years ago. Um, had to pause that for um, a couple of reasons, but now because of COVID, uh, not pe people can't really wrestle each other unless they're same household. So um, we're back to bring our fitness program back. Um, that's been fun. I've also been like a event planner on the side. so. We've had like pop-up shops in our community space and those because events are kind of on hold as well. Um, I am actually doing a pop-up shop next week um, a bit for masks and soap. So if you know anyone that um, sells masks or soaps, um, we're maxing it out to 10 vendors, only 10 customers at a time. So it'll be retail, obviously, um, but a very different type of vendor event. Um, but those are fun for me. I love working with the community and serving the community that way. Um, Technology that scares me, definitely, I think it's both. I think it's definitely the, the phone tracking, like being able to being able to know that they're recording or maybe not recording. And then also I have been hearing a lot of things about Zoom as well, about um, them recording without our knowledge. And I use Zoom like all day long, so that's a little bit tricky. And then, um, yes, the contract, contact tracing. Um, I think it's helpful and also scary as well because you just never know um, if you could be a carrier and never knew it and then you pop up on this um app and be like oh no um but yeah good to be here good to say hello to everyone i can hang out for another 12 minutes until i run to another meeting so tuesday's my meeting day thanks awesome. for having me great to see you and uh, carrie i don't think you went yet did you you're up but let's unmute you first i just i think i'm unmuted now yes you are okay hi everyone i'm carrie the shaker man i'm located up in orange county and i'm missing ob I'm a musician and online rhythm specialist, both teaching and playing, and a healthy, organic, non-GMO superfoods distributor for a leading edge 25-year-old company called Purium Health Products. They're uh, based up in Long Beach. And anyone wishing to purchase some of their awesome stuff, contact me for a $50 discount. And I'm posting that and my email on the uh, chat. <coughs> I miss OB a lot, that's for sure. Uh, the technology, definitely uh, 5G. We don't know enough about it. And some of my friends who are into that stuff uh, doing research say it's extremely bad and uh, we don't see the results. But if we lose bees, for example, from 5G, we're in serious trouble. Uh, everything that you all have mentioned before is perfectly legit as well. It's, we got a lot of weird things going on. Uh, the only other thing I'm particularly concerned about is terrorists who are intentionally spreading COVID by, if uh, they've got some of the germs, oh, putting it on handles of doorways and uh, doing really horrible things. So that's my latest nightmare as of, well, this morning, I think I came up with that one. That's All it. right, great answers. And I think everyone went except for Kevin and myself. Did I, if I missed you, please raise your hand. Okay, no hands are going up, so uh, I'll go, and then I'm going to turn over the balance of the time to Kevin. Uh, my name, again, is Chuck Hardwick, and I'm the organizer of the group. I also help clients with WordPress, hosting accounts, search engine optimization, and web marketing. That's what I really enjoy the most is the SEO and the web marketing. Um, and then um, as far as uh, technology, I'm going to answer both parts because... I, I found out something about TikTok the other day. I don't know if you guys are familiar with TikTok, but it's a social media platform. And I was told that TikTok, every time you copy something to your clipboard, it gets sent to TikTok. So if you're copying and pasting usernames and passwords, it might be in China somewhere if you're using TikTok. So I'm not gonna go with TikTok for a while. I don't really trust it at this point. Um, and I, Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn keep me busy enough as it is. And then the technology that I'm excited about is blockchain. And I really like the fact that like with Bitcoin, there's a limited number of coins that will ever be minted, which is going to keep the price high. You can't just keep printing 
Bitcoin like you can US dollars. So I find that very exciting. Um, so it is 1221. So Kevin, I'm going to turn the balance of the time over to you. You have in excess of 30 minutes. I am going to set an alarm on my phone for 1255. So if it does go that long, I'll um, interrupt you and just let you know you have five minutes to wrap it up because we want to be respectful of people's time if they do have to leave at one. Um, and then Kevin, if you, um, do you have to go right at one or if it does go a little bit longer, are you able to stay on and answer some additional questions? Yeah, I can stay and answer some questions for about another 10 minutes after that. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so if everyone could um, please mute your microphones and uh, we'll turn the balance of the time over to Kevin. And Kevin, thank you again for speaking. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Good, thanks, Chuck. So again, it's great to uh, hear all of you, especially again, some of those concerns over technology. And I think a lot of those concerns are very valid uh, and, and for some really good reasons. So uh, before we begin, just to kind of get a, a reset of just how far we've come. So how many of you grew up watching black and white TV? We'll just do it by a show of hands. So how many of you watch growing up black and white TV? How many of you grew up before there was TV? Again, so there's even some of those that I've come across, so like in Rotary Clubs when I give a presentation that we're here before TV, um, some even before radio. So I grew up in a small Minnesota, on a small Minnesota farm. Um, actually, while we did have running water, we did not have indoor plumbing until I was six years old. So I learned from a very early age even how to write my name in the snow. So there's a lot of different ways you can kind of you know, can grow up and experience things. But we had a black and white TV that got three channels. And so when you cheer for sports teams, basically it was either you're cheering for light gray or dark gray. So that was really kind of what we were going for. Um, but it's amazing where technology has changed, um, especially when you think back 50 years to that era when like a lot of people still had black and white TV and it was those early days. Um, then even 30 years ago when I got my first PC, uh, you know, a Mac, and it was just amazing technology at the time and very early stage. Um, and then as this continued to evolve, even 10 years ago now with the explosion of the internet and all the different mobile technologies and how everything now has become, you know, amazing how much information and all these different techs are now within just a mobile phone, including cameras and GPS and all of those things. So technology is really evolving at a much faster pace and faster, faster. Um, so what we're gonna talk today a little bit about is uh, the disruptive technologies that are coming. Um, and to give you an idea of it, and it's not only just technology, but it's actually innovation. And to give you an example, this isn't the first time we've actually ex you know, experienced digital innovation or disruptive innovation. So go back to a story that happened in the early 1800s. Uh, this guy named uh, Frederick Tudor in 1805 created a, uh, an industry called ice harvesting. So he decided we're just gonna cut giant blocks of ice out of lakes, we're gonna ship it down to these warm weather climates and they'll be able to use it. Well, by the end of the 1800s, it, they were shipping 20 million tons of uh, ice on a regular basis. So it became this huge industry and there was a lot of innovation that happened during that time. Everything from ice cutting, how you're doing that, the snow plows that were used, uh, insulation, different types of that, even delivery, uh, even the creation of the ice box and how that was done. But every single one of those industries was put out of business within a very few uh, short time of years by refrigeration, a disruptive innovation that kind of hit. So you had this thriving industry that was suddenly gone. And we've kind of seen that happening over and over again in different technologies. Well, today there's a lot of that innovation happening and due to digital technologies, it's about to become very disruptive. So what are some of the key technologies that are driving change? So I'm just gonna go by uh, the World Economic Forum actually listed uh, five technologies that they predicted will have the biggest impact on some of the wide ranging of industries. And so the first one is AI and robotics. So obviously artificial intelligence, um, it may in a single generation produce more technological breakthroughs than humankind has managed during the first 20,000 years of existence. 
They anticipate that nearly half of all the US jobs will likely be automated by 2050. So that's gonna create a huge disruption. So there's a lot of different ways AI and robotics are being applied and some of them are really exciting to see. So you got things like exoskeleton. So exoskeleton obviously is just like a, almost like a suit of armor that you wear on the external so that you can stand and move around. So imagine that if you're in a wheelchair, now you can actually walk. Um, for so people who are disabled or have you know, physical issues, say elderly, this is gonna be a huge breakthrough. It's really gonna make a difference. It can also be used for military, obviously for them carrying a lot of gear or for nurses who have to lift people, um, loggers, miners, uh, firefighters, all these exoskeleton technologies to be able to perform and do things are really exciting breakthroughs, especially again, how it can impact our disabled. Another one going in a totally different direction is nanobots. So instead of having these big suits of armor wear, they shrink it down to just a microscopic size and you can actually swallow it, ingest them. And they can actually deliver medicine. So let's say you have cancer. They can actually deliver the medicine to that specific part of your body that actually has the cancer. So instead of going through a full chemo treatment, you can actually be very precise in how you do that. So that's the nanobot technologies. Um, and they're used even to create new neural pathways within the brain. Um, Elon Musk, who many of us are very familiar with, um, is working on a thing called Neuralink which basically is just that. It helps develop more trigger neur neurons within the brain based on these nanobot connections. Um, and Harvard doctors have actually created an, el an electronic mesh to treat uh, Parkinson and Alzheimer's. So a lot of applications for nanobots. Um, another area that we're really gonna see a lot, I think coming up is companionship robots. So we know that it's, it's kind of the merging of two different technologies. So we know robotics. A lot of the robots that we see are becoming more human-like in how they are, how they visually look. Um, well, then now the other as aspect to that is conversational chat. You know, these chatbots that we can have a conversation with that sound very real, um, where you can get a phone call for somebody and you really can't tell the difference between what's a chatbot and what's a real person. And those technologies are gonna merge to the point where basically now we could have a companion um, and, and basically where you, you can't really tell the difference. And relationships for people are really difficult. And so if you have the option instead of having to deal with a real husband, a real wife or partner, and you know, the challenges that we have in relationships, if you're introverted, you much rather go for a conversational robot who understands you that you can still talk to and interact with. And so, I view uh, companionship robots to be one of those areas that's really gonna explode in the next 10 years. Um, obviously, a lot of this technology is used for real-time translation. You go on a trip to, let's say, Germany or Egypt or Italy, and when somebody speaks to you, you can have an earpiece in your ear. Um, there's actually a device called Pilot that does this, and you can actually hear exactly what they're saying in English. So again, a lot of that technology is interesting. And it's also being applied to um, the legal field. So instead of having a public defender, you could basically have a robot defender. Um, they're able from an AI standpoint to process all these different tons of cases um, at once and understand what's the best way to defend you based on the case history, as opposed to a public defender who's got inundated with cases, doesn't have the time to devote to you, maybe an hour or two to your case, and so a lot of this is really gonna benefit those, especially um, th those who don't have the means to hire a good legal team. So all of that's gonna make a big difference. So again, so that's the AI and robotics. Uh, next one is big data. So big data, basically what that means, it reveals the insights into people such as patterns, trends, and behavior. So what's amazing to know is that 90% of data has been created in the last two years. So to give you a, just a sense of what this is, so imagine data in a file cabinet. Okay, so if one megabyte of inf information is equal to a file folder and a gigabyte is equal to a file cabinet, um, well, prior to 2016, there was about 500 billion file cabinets of data. Well, now in 2020, just four years later, that amount of information is now 40 trillion files cabinets full of data. Um, so now imagine what's gonna be in five years from now or 10 years from now. So 
Then it's become, we have all this data. Now, how is it being applied? Um, so there's some really good things, again, like a lot of things. Um, medical diagnosis. So they're already using it in, in breast cancer screening. Uh, they input like 100,000 different you know, breast cancer screens and then help teach, train the computer on how this actually works and which ones are most likely to be actual cancerous. Um, and so now it makes diagnosis far more reliable and credible than say just a trained human eye. So again, much better systems for that. You'll see it in, again, mammography, stroke, disease, uh, diabetes, all these kind of things that'll be used for. Um, it'll also be used in things like dating. You know, data can actually be used um, to, to connect people based on your preferences and their preferences. Um, so imagine if you got a message on your phone like this. So someone is attracted to you and fits your style. She's free tomorrow night. We know that both of you like the same band and it's playing down the street. Would you like to get us, us to get you tickets? So if you can imagine, all of this is gonna be set up for you and all of that data basically is already available. It's just how it's being applied. Uh, data within sports, we're really common with that, with the movie Moneyball, all of that. Obviously, analytics is always really big when it comes to your swing analysis, your body performance. Olympic athletes have used it for years. Uh, Michael Phelps used a lot of it, not only in the, the swimsuit design, they got a lot of data feedback from that, but he also used it to monitor his sleep patterns and his diet um, on a regular basis, so he knew how to optimize his performance. Um, and right now, what it's being applied to is going far beyond just sports. Now they're looking at how can we apply this aspect to job performance? How can we make sure that people optimize their time and everything else? Um, so that's another area that's doing it. And of course, from the positive, it could also have a negative implications. Um, we saw what happened in politics in 2016 when Cambridge Analytica uh, tapped into 87 million Facebook profiles and they were able to determine some of that. So some of the concerns obviously were with, you know, the idea of uh, tracking and eavesdropping. Those are definitely major concerns. And when you can feed the, Disruption from a propaganda kind of standpoint of however, what, whatever voice you want to do, um, there's a lot of danger within that. And uh, so that obviously is creating an issue. So another area is what we call the Internet of Things. So IoT. So, and that's really what the Internet of Things is, is a connection between the physical and the digital world. So it's actually grown from 7 billion items connected to what they anticipate will be 50 billion items connected to the internet by 2022. So in just two more years, that's how much it's exploding. So some of the things that you'll experience on a regular basis, obviously Siri and Alexa, you know, open up our car door, turn on the lights, all of these kind of things are, are just really common. Um, you can have smart homes that have like a refrigerator and the refrigerator is so sophisticated that it can actually track whether you're running out of milk and then it'll order milk automatically for you. So those are some of the things that are kind of happening from that kind of standpoint. Wearables, um, what we mean by wearables is clothing or things like you know, a, a Fitbit or a smartwatch. All of those kind of things are very, um, again, have a lot of data to them, but it's the internet of things. It's connected to several different thing, aspects to it. Um, and also ties into the big data aspect. Uh, we're, but, but let's say you have a, a newborn baby, and of course, everybody's kind of worried about, you know, SIDS. So you have her in a little outfit, and you can monitor her breathing on a regular basis. Um, and you can see what her temperature is. And so that's one way of, you know, being able to track that on a regular basis. Um, if you're a patient, and especially now with a lot of this virtual health, you can wear a wearable, and your doctor can see all your vitals on a regular basis. If you have an elderly parent, you can see exactly how well they're doing. So the internet, all this wearable connecting is going to continue to expand. Um, the internet of things also goes to smart cities. So for example, we'll have a better idea of how to optimize traffic, how to optimize you know, electricity, all of those kind of aspects to it. Um, in Barcelona, they're considered one of the most advanced smart cities. Even something as simple as being able to find a parking space. You can get a notice in your car a smart car, they'll tell you exactly where there's an open space and it'll actually be able to bring you right there so you can park. And of course your car will self-park because of how that's going. 
So, and that leads us to the next um, technology they predict, and that is the self-driving cars and drones. And I'll be uh, honest, so here about 10 years ago was when this really kind of hit the floor where people were really talking about it. And I thought at first it was just kind of a joke, like who'd ever have a self-driving car that you could trust? Um, and especially the idea of drones, when we were talking about, you know, the packages being delivered and being almost like a pinata, you know, I thought, well, gee, if, if I see, you know, a drone flying over from a delivery from Amazon, it's almost like you take out a gun, you shoot down the drone and hey, you get a prize every time. And so it was just this aspect that that's kind of what you really thought was going to happen with that. So at some point, they anticipate almost like these giant warehouses in the sky. If you imagine a big blimp version of an Amazon warehouse flying over and then all these drones basically coming down and doing delivery and then going back up. So that also is one of those that could happen in the, next, in the future. So those are some of the ways it's going to impact our lives. Um, obviously, self, you know, the, all of this self-driving cars and and drones use a mix of technology, including you know, GPS, cameras, um, sensors, all of that kind of aspect to it. Um, for self-driving cars, you know, they'll have cars that, uh, again, I live in Minnesota, I mean, I live in California, but I'm from Minnesota. If I wanna drive, drive back to see family, I could literally hop in a car and uh, take a nap for 30 hours and then wake up in, in the Midwest. So there's definitely some of those kind of aspects to that of where it could go. You could work the whole time and have an office within the back of the car, have entertainment, you know, giant TVs that'd be part of your back seat so you can actually have that. So a lot of that kind of things will be interesting. Um, we actually might not even need garages or parking lots because the, either the cars will be continuously moving or if you did go to the office, rather than park at a parking lot, you would just notify your car to come you know, pick you up at the office. It would drive it there by itself pick you up and then it would just go back to where you want it to go. So a lot of different applications for that. Um, drones obviously with Amazon and uh, package delivery, agriculture is huge, restroom disaster re relief. Uh, imagine being a lifeguard and you have a drone, you can just rather than swim out to a person, you could fly the drone over, drop them a life preserver, uh, be able to save them instantly, much faster, more effective, and then swim out and get to them. Um, so a lot of great applications for it. So another one that was mentioned before was uh, 3D printing. So 3D printing is fascinating. It's one of the most fascinating fields I see. Um, so when Bill mentioned that, you know, the idea they can print organs, you know, that is, that is real. And the nice thing about it, if they print your organ using your skin cells, um, and be able to grow them and culture them, well then there's, there's no rejection because it's all your skin cells basically, so the body won't reject it. And so you don't have to go through those rejection drugs. Um, so a lot of great aspects of what can be done there. And then we look at, you know, again, manufacturing. You can print, 3D print a house within a day. Uh, instead of you know, building, a, in China, they built a three-story building within 45 days with a crew of like 10 people. So you can't do that in normal construction. And they're, they're still highly developed because these are all based on computer programs and layered by layer. So structurally, they're extremely sound. Um, so a lot of benefits to what can happen in the 3D printing, not only for us, but third world countries to bring down the cost of things. Um, they even have a, let, let's say, from the military standpoint, if you're in a tank in the middle of, let's say, Afghanistan and something breaks down, you can just basically 3D print the part you need right within the tank by having a certain 3D printing there and then install it. So you don't have to go back to the part shed in order to do it. You can be up and running in just a few hours. So again, it's amazing technology. And it's used in medical, construction, manufacturing, food. Imagine printing a, a hamburger or a plant burger, um, fashion, all of those kind of aspects to it. And then, uh, so these are the main five, but one that wasn't to men mentioned that I think is also very valid is uh, virtual reality, digital reality, virtual reality and augmented reality. So this, you know, right now they're getting to the point where right now you wear a headset, but now they're gonna down where it's almost like just wearing a basic pair of sunglasses. You put it on and you can take a trip to imagine yourself hiking Mount Everest. 
or take a tour of the Louvre or some of these kind of things. Um, it's, it's amazing where that can go from a travel aspect or people who happen to be shut in or right now with COVID where you just don't feel like you can't go anywhere. Um, the other aspect is education. It'll help us learn a lot faster if we're immersed in an experience as opposed to just uh, believing it. So all of those things are gonna make a big difference. And for disabled people, you know, to be able to help them relearn how to do things, if you can experience it in your mind, again, just by that idea of the virtual world, um, it helps you learn a lot faster. So all of those technologies are really gonna be uh, exploding. So one of the unique things about all of these kind of things is the fact that, again, with 3D printing, Internet of Things, big data, AI, self-driving, and VR, is that they're all interconnected. So a lot of these kind of feed on each other, and that's really what's kind of making it. And it's estimated um, that by 2025, all these new technologies could create $100 trillion in net benefits across all industries. So again, this is where it's really kind of getting to the point where if you're not doing anything in any of these areas, you're gonna be falling behind extremely fast. Um, could you imagine if you're not doing it, then your competitors are, or those kind of aspects. And that's really some of the key. So for a lot of us individuals, it's gonna be, how do we deal with change? As a culture, we hate change. M most people get very into the comfort zone. And now we're at a point where we have to constantly be learning. Uh, and on a regular basis. Um, when you figure that, again, half the jobs are gonna be gone because of all this autonomy within uh, by 2050. So I have you know, some sons right now graduating from college that within five years, whatever they went for the major, might be totally gone and irrelevant. So we're getting into a society now that's gonna make it required that we constantly learn and adapt. Um, so what are some of the things that people can do to really you know, grasp this? And one of those is just become comfortable with change. And one of those is just to go back to learning, but one of the things to learn is soft skills. And so what I would suggest is um, one of the soft skills to develop, obviously, because that's the big thing, because the hard skills are gone now, is creativity. So I'll just give you a, a quick thing here. So, So creativity itself was actually um, one of the most sought after skills by, by CEOs. And the reason is, is that it's so rare and it's so needed for them to be able to kind of see opportunities, to be able to make connections behind different things. And that's really what creativity and innovation is about, making new connections. So for instance, this is a, a black dot on a piece of paper. So I'd like each of you, if you could just type into the chat, what is that black dot? mean or mean not mean but a, a creative way of looking at this so for instance it could be a the nose of a polar bear in the snowstorm so just think of some ideas of what you could uh well, what this could be miniature black hole burnt bagel Plug to the fourth dimension, great answers. Dalmatian spot, good. Nucleus of a cell, a starting point. Um, yeah, so all of those are really good, uh, good answers. So when you ask, a lot of times when you get into these sessions, and I've done you know, credit sessions like this on a regular basis, when you get into it, a lot of times the adults just have trouble coming up with more than like 10 or 12 different answers, yet you can go to an elementary kindergarten class and they'll come up with 300. And so that's kind of the fascinating thing about it. And it could be anything from a person with a, an Afro walking across you know, the, the salt flats uh, in Salt Lake City to like an ant in a sugar bowl. Um, so all of those kind of things are very creative. Well, again, we all were born 100% creative. By the time we hit the age of 40, most of us are down to like 2%. So the more we can grasp and get our, train ourselves to be creative again, That'll help us in adapting to new technology. Um, the other is to stay aware of trends. You know, Trend Hunters is a great site I recommend to anybody. Uh, they list out on a regular basis what are some of the hottest trends in a lot of different industries. Uh, very interesting site to see. Um, and then always kind of be, uh, stay focused on, on the future. You know, well, what's coming up next? So 
we have just a few more minutes. I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna finish with one key thing and then we'll open up to questions. So all of this is kind of leading to a, an interesting point. And again, these are all amazing technologies in general and they're all gonna disrupt our lives. But probably the biggest question that even Stephen Hawking had before we, he passed away was, what's gonna happen when we get to this point of singularity? And so basically singularity is the point at which all this technology, the AI, the robots and all that have an equal intelligence to what humans do currently. And so Stephen Hawking said, if AI becomes better at designing AI than humans, then we'll hit an intelligence explosion that will ultimately result in machines whose intelligence exceeds ours by more than ours exceeds that of snails. So in other words, he realizes that once the robots get smarter than we do, it's just gonna to totally explode and we're gonna be so far behind, we'll, there's no way we can contain it. Um, and so, so here's some of the predictions that they figured it might happen by 2045 is when they think that this sing singularity tipping point is gonna happen. So there's one of five different ways it could go. And these are called crazy predictions by, these, um, by Ray Kurzel who's the Google director of engineering and a well-known futurist. So one is that machines will make better machines. Again, so that goes into that uh, Stephen Hawking quote, where they're gonna get so much better at making machines than we are, they're just gonna explode. Two, AI will find out there's no use for humans. There's been a lot of you know, uh, movies and stuff about that, where basically the robots take over, um, Terminator, all of that, and that could be a, a real scenario, and that's one of those predictions. Um, the economy could grow at 60 to 250 times the current rate um, because it, it, it's happening so fast because new technology and new ways of applying things, and they have all this data now, they'll be able to create things and new solutions um, where our economy could double every 15 years, where, where our, our economy currently doubles at every 15 years, we could do that same uh, doubling within every month. So that's how fast our economy could grow. Um, it could greatly extend human life, potentially infinitely. We already know about you know, the cell damage, um, how it could regenerate some of the cells that are damaged by aging. Um, they're identifying some of those genomes that we talked about. Um, you know, Marissa mentioned the genetic issues. Those could definitely be affected by that, uh, just by replacing any you know, defective DNA. Um, so anyways, we do have that potential to extend our lives for much further, you know, at least to 150 years. And then um, five nanobots will plug our brains directly into the internet. So suddenly we'll all have the equivalency of having uh, the encyclopedia within our mind and be able to access information on a regular basis on a need no basis. So all of that's really kind of fascinating things. And that's typically where, again, where they envision some of the greater aspects, the greater leaps to happen within technology and where it could really disrupt our lives. So at this point, um, Chuck, I'll leave it, uh, turn it back to you to open up for questions. Awesome, I'm gonna try to unmute everyone um, because I want everyone to give, well, I wanna uh, hit unmute all. If you guys could all unmute, I wanna give Kevin a big round of applause. Thank you, great job, Kevin. Thanks. And so I had a question. Um, you mentioned the website. Was it trendhunter.com? Is that the yeah, one? Tr tr yeah, I think it's plural. Trendhunters.com. Oh, trendhunters. Trend Hunters. Okay. And one, then one of the two. But yeah. Okay. Great presentation. I love this stuff. My other question is I have a nephew. He's going to be a freshman at San Diego State, and he has an engineering type mind. Knowing what you know, what would you advise him to major in, knowing with all of these changes that are going to come up? Is, should he major in creativity or computer science or something else? Or do you have any input on that? Sure. So the, the biggest industry right now, the biggest need is data scientists. So these are people who actually know how to apply um, and do something with all the data out there. Because there is so much of it, the biggest challenge is how do we manipulate it? How do we control it? So data science is the biggest industry. Engineering, anything in the tech field is obviously going to be booming. Um, at the same time, I would just highly recommend he develop his soft skills at the same time. His sense of you know, the, the creativity and those innovation, any kind of classes he can take to help in, enhance those. 
those soft skills are going to be needed more and more as we have to go through this continual learning aspect to it. But um, again, so data science would be key. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone else um, have any questions for Kevin? Hey, Bill. Hi. Um, fascinating. Great presentation and uh, topic I've been uh, perplexed in and interested in for a while. And of course, uh, all this sort of suggests that we're, we're in a period of dehumanization that uh, you mentioned the soft skills, but you know, where in all of this progress falls uh, love, hope, faith, um, things that make us human. And uh, in, in there's a, a great book, I posted it in the chat, uh, uh, Alvin Toffler, that you might remember, wrote uh, Future Shock, uh, wrote a book called Revolutionary Wealth in which he talks about uh, nanotechnology being only the first phase of miniaturization and the impact that it ha will have on our lives. And uh, he does recite in there, uh, for example, a lot of these Middle Eastern countries whose economies have relied on fossil fuels and, and um, uh, producing uh, 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 oil. And in the absence of any sustainable means of supporting themselves, um, their export of the future will be terrorism. And so, uh, you, you know, it, this is kind of where we bump up against uh, digital technology and the human mind. And how do we reconcile that, or what is going to be the um, backlash uh, to our society? Obviously, the judicial system is not able to, and our political leaders are uh, incapable of, it would seem, to adapt to this, this new world. I, I agree that there's a lot of issues there. And even from a terrorism standpoint, I know at one point they were talking about building this massive missile defense system around the whole country and to me it was just like well why would you build a whole missile defense system if i really want to attack you i would just do something to attack your electric grid i mean if, if we are all these connected to everything and if they wipe out our electric grid well now you've just literally shut down as much as you do and did more disruption than any single missile would ever do so and it'd be harder to track so things like that would be far more effective um yeah, I mean, it's, it's this idea, let, let's say, even just that contrast between love and terrorism. I mean, there's so much goodwill and great things that can happen from a tech standpoint for third world countries to help increase the quality of life for a lot of different people within it. Um, but it can be used for really negative aspects, too. And but even just by governments, even our own government. Um, there's, if you are... It all really depends on that intention. If you're really for, you know, you're corrupt or if you're really for power, all of those kind of things, there's a lot of ways to manipulate uh, mindsets. Again, even just, again, from a propaganda standpoint of how easily manipulated our country is. Um, so there's a lot of concern that I have specifically within that area of how all of this can be used in a very negative way. Um, even the idea of, you know, putting, say, nanobots so we all would have equal amount of brain power. What person who already has brain power wants everybody to have that? It would never be accessible because they wouldn't want that because that would lose their power. Just like most countries don't want, or some of these powerful dictators don't want their people to be educated because it loses their power. So I think that's going to be an issue. Hey, Thalia? Hi, uh, thank you for a really thought-provoking and uh, fascinating topic and presentation today. Um, one thing that came to my mind while you were talking about this was how, you know, there's really nothing great about the coronavirus except for the fact that I think it's pushed technology further than we may have, you know, as a as a humankind gone in the last six months. I think it's really like, you know, the whole idea of ordering online, uh, the whole idea of, um, 
the contact tracing and kind of understanding the world from a from a different point of view. Uh, Zoom calls like this that I would have not been on before, you know, and it's kind of opening up a whole different world. So if there's any silver lining, I guess that's it to this whole situation. Um, I wanted to ask you about Think Creative, and and I was curious to know about that. I'm not sure if I missed that. If I came in right at right at the start of the presentation. So. Sure. So my company is actually WildSpark, um, and it evolved from a company called Think Creative. And so, but WildSpark, I specialize in innovation consulting, basically, as a, if you can imagine an advisory board that a company would have. Well, I come in as an innovation um, advisor. And so helping them take a look at where they are right now, how, what kind of new technologies can we really embrace? Um, where are some opportunities that we might not be seeing? And where are some threats that we might not be? So if you can imagine, um, so for instance, some of the threats are like companies that aren't even in our space. So for instance, like Uber is a taxi service that was, you know, um, it is a taxi service not invented by a taxi company. Airbnb is a hotel service not invented by a hotel company. iTunes, music service not invented by a music company. Um, PayPal, a banking service not invented by a banking company. So a lot of times those outside players can really disrupt it, just like the refrigerator kind of disrupted all of that entire industry and it wasn't by anybody currently in the industry. So sometimes those are the scary ones are the ones that are hard to predict. Uh, even the healthcare industry right now, um, Walmart has just launched three Walmart super healthcare centers where basically you can go in to, and have uh, MRI, you know, EKG, whatever else you need, all the different x-rays and a lot of service have done for $40. So because of that, they're going to majorly disrupt this. And I anticipate there'll be, they'll be in every state within probably three to five years. Um, and greatly expanding just like Walmart does, because they're gonna totally disrupt the healthcare system just on that aspect. And then you have other players like, um, the two other big players coming into healthcare are Apple and Google because of all the data. And so if those outside players, how, how would Walmart take over your company or your service? What, how could somebody else do it? Those are the scary ones to some of those. Um, the biggest thing is that most of us get really comfortable in our design we, we think really incremental changes. We don't think of major disruptive changes. And um, some of those are, are the ones that are gonna, again, could literally put us out of business within five years. If you look at, you know, Netflix is exploding, but Blockbuster is gone. Um, you know, Kodak is gone. All these ones that were just institutional companies are just gone. Um, and we never would have thought of that growing up. And that could happen with a lot of other kind of things. And, so it'll be really interesting to kind of see where that goes. But so what I do is help companies kind of just see things in new ways, um, open up their minds to different technologies and how they can embrace it and make the most of it. Cool. But thank you for the question. Sure. So it is hey, 12. Scott. Yeah, thank you so much. It is 1259. Um, so I want to thank you again. And before we sign off, um, does everyone know how to get a hold of Kevin? Have you provided your website or your contact? I have not. I, I can put it chat. into the, the chat. That but, would be um, perfect. Yeah. And so then while he's doing that, that maybe we have time for one more question. If and the one, one thing I'd suggest is hook up with me on LinkedIn too, because uh, I, I share a lot on LinkedIn um, and I'm happy to, um, happy to connect. And What's then, your uh, last name again? Uh, Ellinger, I just typed it into the chat, E-H-L-I-N-G-E-R. And I share a lot of different things on, on trends and some of the other kind of things that are happening. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a great way to connect and I'd love to connect with you all. I'm curious, have you uh, ever uh, found or uh, heard of a website called Innocentive? Uh, yes, I have, actually. Yeah. Uh, you said you pasted it into the chat session, but I don't see anything from you lately. I don't either. Did you not hit enter, perhaps? Oh, he he sent it to me privately. Oh, I sent ah. it to privately. Yes. Sure, so, yeah, so sure. That, so. Favor carry. <laughs> oh, wait, Jose. <laughs> May I call you Jose? <laughs> I, so I had an interesting thought. So about 10 years ago, um, I was in a discussion group about um, autonomous cars 
And it was, what do you think of them? Could they be whatever sort of thing? And I remember what stood in my mind was the thought of programming or having to program on a social level if there was an accident, who, who dies, if you will, right? So if two cars were coming and then there was a challenge, does the car swerve? And if, it, if it's a mother and child walking on the street, do you sacrifice the car? Or if it's a young person, do you drive into them instead of the head-on collision? All these kind of social ramifications of who, who chooses what the acceptable loss is. And it was such a crazy debate on that, which they, they seemed to indicate was the reason why it wasn't um, out sooner, because that philosophical debate has to be you know, figured out. Well, even there was a movie by Will Smith, and I forget the name of it, obviously, but it was about robots. And one of the reasons he hated robots, because here he was a policeman, and early in the film, they kind of have a flashback, and they show that there was a child in a car, and he was under, both of them were trapped underwater, and the robot saved him because the robot calculated that his chances of, were, of survival were much higher than the child's were. So that's how that made the decision. And of course, he always had angst because of that, uh, or felt guilty because of that. So, but it, yeah, and that was another movie that really kind of showed the robots taking over. And um, but even again, yeah, the idea of companion ro robots, and and that's an idea. You know, if you can think of all these people right now, for a stereotype, you know, all the the nerds in the basement playing video games. Well, again interconnecting social relationships are really kind of difficult and so if they can, can instead just have a companion robot i can see where that might be uh an alternative and where some of the industry is going to go so th there goes your love yeah part. there was one other so thing. Good. yeah um there was a quote that i heard a number of years ago that goes right into this and in innovation and change and it's a thinker one right so it says in the world of change the learners shall inherit the earth while the learned shall find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. So if you're stuck in what I know now and this is it and it's gonna be amazing, like you said, Blockbuster versus Netflix, or if you're willing to see, okay, that sucks and it's changing and what do I need to do to be part of that? Um, it's really a cool quote that stuck with me for a long time. Well, especially when you realize that Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix for really minimal amount of money and they turned it down three times. They had three different offers and they turned them down. And that digital photography was invented by Kodak, but they just felt that they were in the film business. So they didn't see <clears throat> that the technology, they didn't see what was next. Where I yeah. admire Netflix though is, and Netflix has been really good about figuring out what's next. Um, they figured out obviously streaming and all of that, but they also realized that at some point these film companies, like say 20th Century Fox, are gonna have all the control over all the content. So we need to create our own content. So the fact that Netflix has gone into becoming a studio and creating all their own original content, to me is really kind of fascinating and very forward looking. All right, well, I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining the call today and hope to see you one week from today as well. Great. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate your time. Uh, and it was great to share. Thanks, Kevin. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Thanks guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye Chuck. Be well. See you.